Hello, and welcome to our lecture for uh, atmospheric circulation. So let's begin. So you might be wondering why we're talking about the atmosphere in an oceanography class. Well, the atmosphere and the ocean are in constant contact with one another at the sea surface, and so they are always interacting with each other. Their gases freely exchange, so gas from the atmosphere dissolves into the ocean, and oceans dissolve from the gas, uh, undissolve into the atmosphere, and water vapor itself evaporates from the ocean and enters the atmosphere. Uh, and this exchange from gas, uh, this gas exchange between the two has uh, significant climate implications. Uh, gases that enter the ocean from the atmosphere that can affect sediment deposition, uh, the distribution of life, and some of the physical characteristics of seawater, such as the uh, pH. And as mentioned, water vapor that uh, comes from the ocean enters the atmosphere and is carried by the wind to different locations to help moderate global surface temperatures. And through rain, water vapor from the ocean carried by the atmosphere provides moisture on land for agriculture and weather which has a significant influence on our daily lives is shaped by the interaction of wind and water at that sea surface. Also the wind currents which are uh, circulation patterns in the atmosphere have a significant influence on ocean currents and ocean circulation. So the atmosphere and the ocean are intimately related and to understand the ocean we have to first uh, have a good understanding of the atmosphere and how the atmosphere behaves. So first we'll talk quickly about how the thermal properties of air changes as it rises or sinks in the atmosphere. So when air rises in the atmosphere, uh, as it get, reaches higher and higher altitude, the atmospheric pressure decreases and as a result the air expands. And In the process of expanding, the air undergoes what's called adiabatic cooling. And this adiabatic cooling is whenever the air cools without temperature being removed from it. So this parcel of air down here is at 30 degrees centigrade and as it rises it's under less and less pressure which allows it to expand. And because it expands the amount of energy, thermal energy per unit volume decreases and therefore the temperature of the gas decreases without any heat being removed and this is known as adiabatic cooling. Conversely, whenever air sinks it experiences higher atmospheric pressure and air compresses and as a result the air adiabatically warms. And so the adiabatic warming is whenever the air increases in temperature increases in temperature uh, without any heat being added to it. it. It increases in temperature solely due to the fact that it has been compressed and now the amount of thermal energy per unit volume has increased and therefore its temperature increases. So once again air changes temperature as it rises and falls in the atmosphere uh, in a process known as adiabatic cooling uh, and warming. Now, the Earth's surface receives external energy from the sun, and this sun, in the form of electromagnetic radiation, uh, strikes Earth's surface and is absorbed. And that absorption of that electromagnetic radiation, or light from the sun, is what heats Earth's surface. But the angle in which that light hits the surface of Earth plays a significant role in how much energy is being uh, absorbed per unit area. So for example, in the far left here we have a flashlight that's being shown straight down onto a surface so that the angle at which the light is intersecting the surface is a 90 degree angle. Now let's say that the area in which this light hits the surface is one unit of area. It doesn't matter what units it is. Let's say, you know, it could be uh, centimeter squared, meter, uh, inches squared, but it's just one unit of area. So now all this energy from this light is being absorbed over one unit of area. Now <clears throat> if we tilt this flashlight so that the angle at which the light strikes the surface is now 45 degrees, 
we can see that the area of the surface in which this light is being distributed over is now larger. It's 1.4 units. So there's the same amount of energy being emitted by this flashlight, but that same amount of energy is now being absorbed over a larger area. So what happens is with the decrease of this angle from 90 to 45, we decrease the amount of energy per unit area being absorbed by the surface. Same amount of energy, but being absorbed over a larger area. So therefore, there is a smaller amount of energy per unit area. And finally, in this scenario on the far right, the angle in which the light is striking the surface is at 30 degrees. And so the area in which the light hits the surface is now two units. It's double the size of the area in the far left situation. It's now the same amount of energy um, the light coming from the flashlight is being absorbed over twice the area. And so as a result, the amount of energy per unit area being absorbed is half of, the, uh, half of that in this far left case. And so the smaller the angle that the uh, light intersects the surface of the Earth at, the larger the area that light is spread over, and the smaller the amount of energy per unit area being absorbed. This is why it's warmer in midday than it is in the morning and dusk, because the sun is, is higher um, overhead, and so the rays of the sun are making them by, or hitting the surface of the earth at a larger angle, so there's more energy per unit area being absorbed during midday than there is in the morning, Remember, the light is coming in at a smaller angle in the evening and the light's coming in at a smaller angle. So due to this, there is a differential heating of Earth due to the sun. So near the equator, the rays from the sun are coming in and they're striking the surface at near perpendicular angles, near 90 degree angles. And so just like with the flashlight, when it was, shown, which was shining directly down on the surface, the amount of energy per unit area being absorbed is at a maximum. So at low latitudes near the equator, we have the largest amount of energy per unit area being absorbed. However, as we increase in latitude in either direction away from the tropics, okay, we see that the light is intersecting the surface at a smaller angle. So the amount of energy per unit area being absorbed is decreasing. So finally we get to the very top where the light is actually parallel to the surface and so that no energy is absorbed on this surface. And so uh, we have the largest amount of energy per unit area being absorbed at low latitudes near the equator and we have the smallest amount of energy per unit area being absorbed at high latitudes near the poles. So this is why it's warm. It's warmer near the equator and cooler as you go higher north or south towards the poles. It's not that the sun is any less bright or there's any less energy. It's that the energy is being spread over a larger area. And so that the amount of energy per unit area being absorbed is less. So that explains uh, why the sun heats the earth differently at different latitudes. It's just the uh, different amounts of energy being absorbed per unit area. So if this is the case, why doesn't the polar ocean freeze solid while the tropical oceans boil away? Well, it's because the water in the atmosphere, uh, sorry, it's because water in the ocean and the atmosphere itself, they move in order to redistribute that heat, that excess of heat at low latitudes. So water's thermal properties, which which I looked at in the last lesson, make an ideal candidate uh, to equalize this polar tropical thermal imbalance. You know, the total heat transported to the poles from the tropics, two-thirds of it is actually transported by air and water vapor in the air, and one-third is transported by liquid water itself. And so, so water vapor in the air transports a significant amount of heat 
in the atmosphere. And this is because, remember, each gram of water vapor carries with it the latent heat of vaporization, 540 calories per gram. While, say, liquid water in the ocean, if, if it heats up by a couple of degrees centigrade, it's only transporting a couple calories per gram. So water vapor carries a lot more heat with it than liquid water does. So here we can see the uh, amount of heat absorbed and radiated or lost by the surface of the Earth uh, on average each year. So that's the radiate energy in one year, that's on the y-axis. Okay. And so the red line is the amount of energy absorbed by the surface at different latitudes. Different latitudes are on the x-axis, so this is the equator, and this is the south pole, and this is the north pole. And the blue line is the amount of heat radiated by the Earth. Okay, So it's the amount of heat given off by the Earth. So if we look, near the equator in the tropics, basically in between 38 degrees north, 38 degrees south, the amount of heat absorbed by the surface is greater than the amount of heat released by the surface or radiated off by the surface. And so there's a net heat surplus. It absorbs more heat than it gives off. However, at higher latitudes closer to the south and north pole, we see the amount of heat the surface gives off is greater than the amount of heat it absorbs. So there's a net heat deficit. Okay, and so if this was the case, if, this, um, if the atmosphere in the ocean did not move to recirculate this thermal imbalance, the tropical waters would just get hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter, while the polar waters would just get cooler and cooler and cooler and cooler. But that excess of heat from this net heat surplus in the low latitudes is redistributed from low latitudes to high latitudes, so from the tropics to the poles. Net, net energy transport is carried out by circulation in the atmosphere and the ocean. And so the reason why we have circulation in the atmosphere and the ocean is because of this thermal imbalance on Earth's surface due to the unequal heating of the Earth by the sun with latitude. So the solar heating in the Earth also varies with the seasons, right? And here in the northern hemisphere, it's warmer in the summer than it is in the in the winter. And why is that exactly? Well, Earth's rotational axis is not is not perpendicular to the plane of the solar system, like this line is that I drew through here. Earth's rotational axis is actually tilted. It's tilted by 23 and a half degrees. And so that tilt of the Earth is the cause of the seasonality on our planet, or why uh, Northern Hemisphere is warmer one part of the year and colder in the other, and vice versa for the Southern Hemisphere. So as we go around the seasons, if we start with uh, the Northern Hemisphere's winter, the Northern Hemisphere is tilted away from the sun. And so the maximum amount of solar energy absorbed by the Earth is going to occur in the Southern Hemisphere. So the Southern Hemisphere is going to absorb more energy than the Northern Hemisphere. And as a result, the Southern Hemisphere is going to become warmer than the Northern Hemisphere. So during this, the Northern Hemisphere has its winter, the Southern Hemisphere has its summer. And you can see this where the Earth has actually been, it's pictured here, but in this case, the rotational axis, the Earth has been pictured in uh, an orientation where its rotational axis is vertical, so that you can see that the southern hemisphere is preferentially lit. So if this is the equator I just drew there, you can see that more of the southern hemisphere is lit than the northern hemisphere. And so, actually, this is where the maximal heating is occurring because the, sun the southern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun. And so the sun's energy is at a largest angle at that part of the planet. Okay. So moving on, we go into what is called spring. In spring, the, the, the northern hemisphere, 
neither the northern hemisphere nor the southern hemisphere are tilted toward the sun. They're both tilted, I guess, um, I guess tangent to the sun. And what happens is that the both northern and the southern hemisphere receive equal amount of solar radiation. Okay, and so this is the transition from from our winter to our summer. And so in this case, the southern hemisphere is beginning to cool because it's not receiving as much energy as it did during our winter. And the northern hemisphere is beginning to warm because it's beginning to receive more energy than uh, it did during our winter. And then as it rotates, as the Earth goes further through its orbit, the northern hemisphere is then tilted toward the sun so that the northern hemisphere is going to absorb more energy per unit area than the southern hemisphere. So now you can see the opposite is true, that then it was in winter, that the northern hemisphere is receiving more solar energy than the southern hemisphere. And so now this axis is tilted towards the sun, and so most direct energy from the sun is striking just in the northern hemisphere. This is the direction in which the sun the energy is coming in, and so you see the maximal energy per unit area being absorbed is occurring in the northern hemisphere, and that's our summer. And finally, we rotate into fall, where the transition from our summer to uh, winter begins. And once again, our Earth's rotational axis is not uh, tilted toward or away this, uh, from the sun. It's tangent, and so like spring, we have equal heating uh, absorption of energy in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. And so the amount of energy per unit area in the, of being absorbed in the northern hemisphere is beginning to decrease while it's beginning to increase in the southern hemisphere as we transition into our winter. So that solar heating is not only unequal with latitude, but it uh, it changes throughout the year due to the seasonality of uh, heating on Earth. And that seasonality is caused by the tilt of Earth's rotational axis relative to the plane of the solar system. So this uneven heating of Earth's surface brings about large-scale uh, circulation in the atmosphere. So here we have this hot radiator in our room. And this radiator radiates heat into the surrounding air, warming the surrounding air. And as a result, as this air warms up, it expands, and when it expands, it's less dense, so it begins to rise. You ever heard the saying, you know, hot air rises? Well, why? Well, because it is less dense. And as hot air rises, it has nowhere to go, so it just hugs the ceiling. It comes over here, where there's this cold window, this closed window and heat is now being drawn out of this air through the window so this air is cooled down in which it contracts it becomes denser and it sinks and then it just returns along the floor to the radiator where it's heated up again it absorbs the heat being radiated from the radiator it expands and it rises and the cycle repeats itself now this is what's called a convection uh, cell so where you have a heat source warming the material, causing the material to move, and a heat sink cooling the material. Now this is what happens in the Earth, where the radiator, the source of heat, is analogous to the low latitudes, the tropics, where the warm, because there's so much energy per unit area being absorbed in those low latitudes, the Earth is radiating a lot of heat off, warming the atmosphere above it, that warm atmosphere rises in the air and it moves at high altitude uh, northward and southward away from the low latitudes towards the poles where it cools and descends and then returns along the surface back to low latitudes. So this is that simplified uh, atmospheric circulation model using the analogy where the, the low latitude is the source of heat and high latitude is the, is the heat sink. So the warm tropics heat the atmosphere above it, so that warm atmosphere uh, rises, 
moves the high altitude towards high latitudes where it cools and it descends and returns down to low latitude along the surface where it's heated up again and it rises and repeats, repeats the uh, cycle. However, it's not this simple. Uh, this is a very simplified model, but there are complexities to it. One of those complexities is the fact that the Earth is rotating. So the Earth is rotating to the east, and because uh, the Earth is rotating, objects that are traveling in the atmosphere, or fluids traveling in the atmosphere, such as air, they don't have to rotate with the solid Earth. And so the Earth rotates underneath the air moving in the atmosphere. And this brings about uh, a reference frame effect, effect called the Coriolis effect. The Coriolis effect is an observed deflection of a moving object caused by the moving frame of reference of the spinning Earth. So as air warms, expands, and rises at the equator and it moves towards the poles, instead of traveling in an observed straight line, the air is deflected to the eastward, eastward. And so being deflected eastward, that means that in the northern hemisphere, air turns to the right, and in the southern hemisphere, air turns to the left of the path that it's traveling. So explain why this is. Let's take this, this sphere here is Earth. And let's look at one city on Earth, Quito in Ecuador. It's right near the equator. Another city, almost due north of it, Buffalo, New York, at a higher latitude. Now, in one day, both of these cities spin, tra traverse through a circle. That is the circumference of the disk that uh, they are on. The, uh, and that disk is perpendicular to the rotational axis of the planet. So each day, both Kido and Japan have to move through the circumference of these circles. Now, the circumference of the circle that Kido has to move through is pretty much the circumference of the Earth, so it's a very large distance. While the circumference of this circle that Buffalo has to move through in one day is smaller. So, Kido has to travel or cover a larger distance in the same amount of time that Buffalo does, which means that Keto must travel at a faster speed. That is the case. If you were to observe these two cities from space, outside, from, from away from Earth, uh, and you can measure the speed of Keto and Buffalo, you would see that Keto is traveling through space at a faster speed than Buffalo is. Now, from the reference frame of Earth's planet, they're not moving relative to each other. But that's on that, that's on the reference frame of the planet where you cannot sense the rotation. External from the planet, you can see and measure that Keto is moving faster than Buffalo. So to explain this further, in the time it takes to rotate through an angle of 15 degrees, Buffalo has to travel this distance right here. While Keto has to travel this distance, which is a longer distance. So in order for Keto to travel this distance, in the same amount of time it takes Buffalo to travel that distance, Keto must be traveling faster. And Keto moves through space at about 1,668 kilometers per hour, which is around 1,036 miles per hour, while Buffalo is moving through space at about 1,260 kilometers per hour, or 783 miles per hour. So Buffalo is traveling at a slower speed through space than Keto is. So now imagine that you were in Keto, Ecuador, and you were, like Keto itself, are traveling to the east at 1,036 miles per hour. And you have a large cannon with a cannonball. And so that cannon and that cannonball are also traveling to the east at 1,036 miles per hour. Now you fire that cannonball due north. What happens is, as that cannonball travels north, it's still traveling to the east at the speed of 1,036 1, miles per hour. 
As it travels north, the ground beneath it, the surface of the earth beneath it, is traveling to the east at a slower speed. So Buffalo is traveling to the east at only 783 miles per hour, while this, while this cannonball is traveling to the east at 1,000 miles per hour. So what happens is the cannonball pulls out ahead of the surface of the land. And so from the ground, it appears as though this cannonball's path is deflected to the right. Now, the same thing is true if you would fire that cannonball south from Buffalo, that, bu that cannonball would be traveling to the east at 780 miles per hour. And as it travels, and as it travels south, the surface of the earth beneath it would be traveling to the east faster, so the cannonball would fall behind the surface of the earth. Because here, the cannonball would be traveling to the east at 780 miles per hour, while the surface of the land is traveling to the east at over a thousand miles per hour. So this is the Coriolis effect and uh, results in the path of objects deflecting to the right of their path, so to the right of their path in the northern hemisphere and to the left of their path in the southern hemisphere. This is a video uh, and there's another video posted on the uh, lessons page that you can watch that can help further uh, explain the Coriolis effect. If you've never heard the Coriolis effect before, it can be a tricky concept to fully grasp. But uh, you can ask questions, uh, do you those videos, and do read, read the text, ask me questions, and do any uh, do additional research on your own. If I, you're, you're still having problems understanding the Coriolis effect. So. We saw that simplified model of atmospheric cir circulation using that model of convection in the room of the radiator and the window. We said that's too simple, those complexities. And adding those complexities in, we get this model. So this is a generalized model of atmospheric circulation on Earth. And so instead of having just one convection cell in the, in the northern hemisphere and one in the southern hemisphere as in a simplified model see we have several in the northern hemisphere and several in the southern hemisphere we actually have three convection cells in the northern hemisphere and we have a mirrored image of three convection cells in the southern hemisphere and you can see that when the air moves within those convection cells its path is deflected so Remember, the air is flowing, say, south in this convective cell. Its path, its path, it doesn't travel in the path that's due south. Its path is, in fact, deflected to the right. And in the southern hemisphere, as air moves along the surface north, it doesn't travel due north. It's, in fact, its path is, in fact, deflected to the left in the southern hemisphere. You see the same thing up here. Instead of traveling north, the air is deflected to the right. And instead of traveling south, the air is deflected to the left. So you see this, the, the direction of the wind here is being dictated by the Coriolis effect. And so, and so these convection cells, they move air within the atmosphere. So the three main the three convection cells that exist in the atmosphere are the Hadley cells, which are these are the these are the convection cells that are, exist in the tropics. So there's a Hadley cell in the northern hemisphere, and the Hadley cell in the southern hemisphere. The feral cells; these are the mid latitude cells. Okay, so this is the convection cells that group islands in. Okay, and then finally there are the polar cells, which are the convection cells near the poles of the planet. So there's three different types of convection cells, Hadley cells, ferro cells, and polar cells, and there's one of each type in each hemisphere, resulting in a total of six convective uh, cells in Earth's atmosphere. So this gives us a three-dimensional view of the flow of the air, while this 
orange colored arrows indicate air warming along the surface and then rising and cooling at high altitude before it descends. It was noticed that air doesn't make it all the way to the poles before it cools to the point where it descends. Now wind patterns develop due to this atmospheric circulation. And major uh, wind features on Earth are include the doldrums, horse latitudes, trade winds, and the westerlies. So the doldrums exist in between, their wind pattern exists in between the, the Hadley cells. So what happens here is this warm air is moving and it begins to rise. It converges and begins to rise. And so here you have the vertical upward motion of air. And there's very little lateral movement of air. The air is pretty much moving vertically and up away from the surface. This uh, occurs in what's a, a region called the ITCZ. It's the intertropical, because it's inside the tropics, convergence zone, where this air is converging from these, from these Hadley cells and rising. So the doldrums is, uh, exist at the ITCZ, the intertropical convergence zone, where you have this low pressure region where air is rising vertically up through the atmosphere. And because there's not a lot of lateral wind, there's no well, air moving parallel to the surface, this would be bad news for sailors if they got stuck in it. And they wouldn't have a hard time getting out of the doldrums because there's no lateral wind to blow them. That's how they got the name, the doldrums, because they uh, were unpleasant to get trapped in as a sailor, because they could be stranded in the ocean with no wind. Uh, the next wind pattern are, is called the horse latitudes. Now, this is the calm area between the uh, feral cells and the Hadley cells. So here, in the feral cells, we have air descending. And so you have your cooler air moving down towards the surface. So like, like the doldrums, you don't have a lot of laterally moving air. It's mostly vertically moving air, air moving down towards the surface. This creates a region of, of high pressure. Anytime you have air moving down, it's high pressure. Anytime you have air moving up, like just like a vacuum suck, sucking air up, that creates low pressure. This is high pressure. And just like the doldrums, this lack of lateral wind movement was not good for sailors. And sailors going from Europe to North America, they would set sail and they would have to cross these horse latitudes to get down into these surface winds. They would blow them over to the New World. And that's how Christopher Columbus discovered the what are called the West Indies, because these surface winds blew him there. But then to return to Europe, the ships would have to sail and get these surface winds that would blow them over back to Europe. And so both times they had to cross these horse latitudes, these latitudes where there's very little lateral movement of wind. And they're called the horse latitudes because if you got caught in them, if you didn't get out in time, you'd have to drop weight so that what little wind you did have, it can move your boat um, more efficiently. And so the drop weight, the first thing that they would drop would be their horses, especially on the voyage returning to Europe. And if things got real desperate, if, um, if, if you were stranded in the horse latitudes for too long and you ran out of your rations, you would have to resort to eating what livestock uh, you would have on board, which uh, often could include your horses. And so getting stuck in the horse latitudes usually turned out to be a bad situation for horses. So uh, at least the that region got named after uh, horses. Who knows how many countless horses uh, faced an unfortunate fate due to ships getting caught in that region of very little lateral wind movement between the feral cells and Hadley cells. Next we have the trade winds, also known as the easterly winds. These are the surface winds associated with the Hadley cells. So as, as the air moves in the Hadley cell and it descends, it returns back to low latitudes. It moves from north to south in the northern Hadley cell and from south to north in the southern Hadley cell. 
And as that wind moves, it's deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. And so as a result, the wind is blowing from the east to the west. And these winds got uh, the name the trade winds. As I mentioned, sailors from Europe would want to go into these surface winds to be blown to the Americas uh, for, for trade, to accumulate uh, goods and, and treasure from the New World to bring it back to Europe for trade. But these winds are also called the easterlies because we, we, we name winds according to where they're coming from because they're bringing the properties of the surface that they have blown over. So it makes more sense to call winds, uh, the name winds based upon the direction they're blowing from. So easterly winds are winds that blow from east to west. Okay, so these are the easterlies, also known as the trade winds. These are the surface winds of the Hadley cells. And finally, we have the westerlies. These are the surface winds of the feral cells. So in the feral cells, we have air moving along the surface uh, from, from low to high latitude, so to the north in the, in the northern feral cell and to the south in the southern feral cell. Now as this air moves along the surface, it's deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere and deflected to the left in the northern hemisphere. So as a result, the wind is blowing from west to east, and so we call these winds the westerlies. And so our prevailing surface winds uh, in Rhode Island are from west to east. Okay. And that's why if you ever notice uh, during a weather forecast, the meteorologist is always referencing what's going on over the continent because the westerlies, westerly winds are going to blow that weather over to us. The meteorologist pays little attention to what's over the Atlantic because that's going to be blown away from us by the westerly winds but we care about what's going on over here because that's going to be brought to us by the westerly winds. So here we can see a, a map of, of winds over the Pacific Ocean recorded on the 20th and 21st of September 1996. The color indicates the speed of the wind, uh, but what's most important we're going to look at is the direction of the wind, which is indicated by these little white arrows. So here you can see the wind is blowing from west to east. The red, it's hard to pick out the red in this background. Sorry, it's, I said west to east, I meant east to west. And they are converging. And where this air is converging, it's, that is the doldrums or the ITCZ. So these are the surface winds of the Hadley cells. So if I were to draw the Hadley cells, it would look like air is moving like this, and it's rising, and it's sinking. These are the Hadley cells. And this is where the air is converging and then rising. So they see these winds, they come in, they converge, and then they rise. So, so that's, this is the intertropical convergence zone. Once again, this uh, region, which the easterlies or the trade winds converge, is inside the tropics, so that's why it's called the intertropical. Uh, these winds are converging and rising, that's why it's called the convergence zone, so the intertropical convergence zone. We really can't see the westerlies because over these two days there's a lot of storm activity in the middle latitudes, and so you can see all these cyclones, which are disrupting the prevailing surface wind patterns. And so we don't see, uh, we can't see those westerly winds because they're of all the disturbances in the middle latitudes through these cyclones. But it's interesting to see those easterly winds converging at the ITCZ. Those are the surface winds of the Hadley cell. So monsoons are uh, wind patterns that, that change with seasons. And those changing wind patterns also bring with them either dry, periods of dryness, or periods of heavy precipitation. So the monsoons are large-scale patterns of wind circulation that, uh, as I said, change with season. Areas with monsoons generally have dry winters and wet summers. In the spring, the air over land rises uh, and cool moist air flows in from the ocean to replace it. That's, that causes heavy precipitation. And monsoons are affected by the movement of the ITCZ as well. So to explain this further, let's look at this image. Where, say, this is 
uh, A, this is during the July. So this is the Northern Hemisphere of summer. And so the majority of the heating is occurring in the Northern Hemisphere. And where that heating occurs, that's where the air is warming and rising. So the ITCZ is in the Northern Hemisphere. You can see as this air flows in, the ITCZ, if we zoom in, we look down here, the ITCZ is right around here, so the air is flowing in and it's rising, and air is flowing in from down here and rising as well. Well, this air is moist because it's absorbing water vapor from the, from the ocean. As this moist air flows in and rises, as it rises, we know that the air begins to adiabatically cool. And as the air rises up the through the atmosphere and adiabatically cools, all this water vapor that the air is carrying begins to condense. And then it precipitates out, causing heavy rainfall. So this region ex uh, experiences large amounts of rainfall because of where the ITCZ is when it's in, during, this, during the summer. As in, north, in the northern part, it's to north of the equator, and all this air is it's moist air from the ocean is flowing in over the land, rising, adiabatically cooling, and all the water vapor is condensing and precipitating out. But during the winter, however, the southern hemisphere is absor absorbing the most solar radiation. So the ITC, so where the air is warmest and rising, is in the southern hemisphere. So the ITCZ is down here below the equator. And so now this area, where it was. It's a wet season during our summer. It's now in this dry season. In this area down here, which was dry during the summer up here, it's now experiencing its wet season, where all this moist air is flowing in over land and then rising at the ITCZ, causing large amounts of precipitation. You'll notice that the ITCZ tends to track toward land, and that's because, as you'll see, it kind of attracted towards land. It actually goes above the the equator during the winter to hit this part of West Africa. And that's because, remember, the heat capacity of land is lower than that of water. So land heats up quicker than water. So the air over the land will be warmer than the air over the water, and so it's going to rise where the um, more readily than the cooler air over water. That's why the ITCZ uh, it seems like it's attracted to land. Remember, the ITCZ is where these easterly winds, the surface winds of the Hadley cells, are converging and colliding. So you can picture the ITCZ as the boundary between the, the two Hadley cells. And, and it's at the ITCZ where the doldrums are. Okay, so this is where the air is moving vertically up at this line. It's flowing into this line and then moving vertically up to the atmosphere. So storms are of instabilities or variations in the large-scale atmospheric circulation that we've been looking at. So the westerlies and the trade winds, the doldrums and the horse latitudes, those are uh, large-scale circulation patterns. Okay? Storms are, are smaller-scale instabilities that exist within that larger-scale pattern. So a storm uh, occurs when there's a region of an atmospheric disturbance uh, that is usually low pressure it results in the rotating um, of air masses in towards that low pressure system. And so the storms can uh, form within one air mass or between two large air masses, which we'll discuss what an air mass is uh, in a little bit. So tropical cyclones are those storms that originate in tropical regions. These storms, as most of us know, can cause millions of dollars worth of damage and endanger life. Or and extratropical cyclones are those that occur at mid-latitude between the polar cells and the feral cells. And it usually occur in the uh, winter and spring. So a cyclone is a large or huge rotating mass of low-pressure air in which the winds converge and ascend. So the, so the air is flowing in inwards and it ascends in the center. The cyclones rotate counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere, and they rotate clockwise in the southern hemisphere. So, a 
why this is, is as the wind's coming in, so in this case, the wind's coming in this direction. If it's rotating this way, it means that the wind's being deflected to the left. This is the southern hemisphere. This one coming in is deflected to the left. And so as a result, the air begins to rotate in and begins to spiral clockwise. So this is a cyclone in the southern hemisphere. The cyclone in the northern hemisphere uh, is rotating in the opposite direction. So as I mentioned before, storms can form between or within air masses. And an air mass is a large body of air with nearly uniform properties, that is temperature and humidity. And the density of air depends upon temperature and humidity. So if air has uniform temperature and humidity, that means it has uniform density. Uh, an air mass paused over land will take on the characteristics of the surface below. And air mass paused over cold land will become cold and dry, for example, and air mass paused over warm land will become warm and dry. Air masses that are paused over warm oceans will become warm and humid. Air masses paused over cold oceans will become cold and humid. So basically, an air mass takes on the characteristics of the surface below. If the surface below is cold and dry, the air mass will be cold and dry. If the surface below is warm and humid, the air mass will be warm and humid. So cold, dry air masses are dense. And so the cooler the air is, the denser it is. And the drier the air is, the denser it is. The more humid the air is, the less dense it is. So cold, dry air is denser than warm, humid air. And so cold, dry air masses are dense, and they form zones of high atmospheric pressure. Anytime you have high atmospheric pressure, you have stability. That's going to be good weather where warm, humid air masses are less dense, and they form zones of lower atmospheric pressure because less dense air wants to rise up. So air moving up vertically in the atmosphere creates low pressure, just like air being sucked up by a vacuum, that upward movement of air creates low pressure. And that's usually when you have weather. You have low pressure zones caused by warm, humid air. Air masses can move within or between atmospheric circulation cells, so air masses can move within Hadley cells and between Hadley cells and feral cells and so forth. But whenever two air masses of different densities meet each other, uh, they don't mix because fluids of different density don't like to mix. And so what they do is they form a boundary between one another known as a front. So here we're going to look at how an extratropical cyclone forms. An extratropical cyclone forms between two air masses. Here we have a warm air mass to the south and a cool air mass to the north. And the boundary between them forms a front. So this is just a front. This isn't a warm front or this isn't a cold front. This is just a typical front. And what happens is a low pressure anomaly develops along that front. What happens is the warm air begins to move from high to low pressure, and the cold air begins to move from high to low pressure. So as this warm and cold air begins to converge into slow pressure, the air begins to rotate. And as the air begins to rotate, what develops is a cold front and a warm front. A warm front is the boundary between the cold and warm air mass where a, the warm front is coming in. It, it, is uh, moving forward, and a cold front is a boundary between a warm and cold air mass, or cold air is coming in. And what happens is, if you look at a cross section from point A to point B, and look what's happening vertically in this in this system. As this air, this warm air, moves over this cold air, the warm air is less dense than the cold air, and so the cold air wants to stay along the surface so the warm air is gradually pushed up over top of this cold air. So it very gradually reaches higher and higher altitudes where it gradually cools, adiabatically cools, and gradually the water vapor in the atmosphere 
condenses on precipitates. So you have widespread precipitation at this warm front. A lot of precipitation, but it's not concentrated, it's spread out. But when a cold front, you have cold air advancing, the, that cold front wants to hug the ground because it's denser. And so the warm air in front of it is just pushed out of the way, just pushed upward dr uh, drastically. And that, that, that quick vertical movement of this warm air carries with it that water vapor, which is, and as the air rises, it evaporates cools and that water vapor begins to condense out very rapidly. And whenever that water vapor is condensing, for each gram of water vapor can, that condenses 540 calories of heat are released to the surrounding atmosphere, which increases its temperature, which makes it want to rise with even more vigor. And the re re release of all this energy in an isolated region um, puts a lot of energy in the atmosphere, which creates uh, more powerful storm activity. This is how thunderstorms are produced. So here's an example of a cyclone in the northern hemisphere. So you have air moving in. So uh, you can see the fronts in here and because it's a northern hemisphere you can see that the cyclone is uh, rotating counterclockwise. And so see this cyclone formed probably between uh, the cold air mass of, so this is the polar cell, and this is probably the feral cell. And this is the boundary between the two, and there's a low pressure anomaly where this warmer air is rotating in, this cooler air is rotating in. So this is the warm front, this is the warm air, advancing. See this kind of distributed precipitation and this is the cold front right here, the cold air advancing causing this can, uh, very, very, very f uh, focused uh, precipitation in front of the cold front. And so that's why after a large storm often in the summer it will get cooler because that heavy precipitation after a thunderstorm <clears throat> it's followed by cold air, the cold front moving in. So unlike extratropical cyclones, uh, tropical cyclones, they can form within one air mass, not at not along a front. So tropical cyclones, also referred to uh, sometimes as hurricanes, they form over warm tropical oceans. Uh, they are the result of warm, humid uh, air rotating in towards a low pressure anomaly. A tropical storm becomes a hurricane once the wind speeds exceed 119 kilometers per hour. If the wind speeds are less than that, it's either a tropical storm or a tropical depression. So what happens whenever wind speeds eat, reach uh, greater than 119 kilometers per hour, the air can't converge all the way to the center of the low pressure system, and the air begins to ascend uh, along the walls of a cylinder. So the air is rising up through the walls of the cylinder, and the cylinder in the center of the storm is known as the eye. And so at 119 kilometers per hour, uh, what it forms is an eye in the tropical storm. And once an eye develops, that's whenever a tropical storm becomes a hurricane. So the energy that feeds these tropical cyclones is the condensation of water vapor to liquid releasing the latent heat of vaporization to the atmosphere. And hurricanes can be especially dangerous not only due to the significant amounts of precipitation, but the storm surge, uh, which is a, a, a amount of water that's higher um, than the normal uh, high, high tide mark, and also brings stronger waves uh, to the coastline due to all the winds that can damage those coastlines. So what happens is, here's a low pressure system, so air from high pressure is flowing in, rushing into the low pressure. As it comes in, in this case, the air has been deflected to the right, and so it begins to spiral in, so this must be in the normal hemisphere. And as it spirals in, it reaches the center and then it begins to spiral up along the eye wall. And as the air rises, it adiabatically cools. And as the adi air adiabatically cools, water vapor begins to condense. And as that water vapor condenses, it releases the latent heat of vaporization to the air around it, 
which warms the air around it. And as this air around it warms, it becomes less dense and it wants to rise with even more vigor. And because the air wants to rise with even more vigor, it creates an even lower pressure here, which causes air from around here to want to flow in even faster. So as long as this storm is over warm, warm ocean, uh, warm sea surface, there's plenty uh, in the, in the Air, and the air has a lot of water vapor in it, this storm will continue to grow in strength. As more warm humid air rises, all that water vapor condenses out as the air adiabatically cools. As that water vapor condenses out, it releases the latent heat of vaporization to the surrounding atmosphere, which, which increases its temperature, which decreases its density, which makes it want to rise with even more vigor, creating an even larger low pressure zone causing air to flow in with even more vigor. So the, so as, as, as long as these tropical storms, as I mentioned, are over warm sea surfaces, they will increase and increase and increase in uh, intensity. Whenever a tropical cyclone moves over land or moves over cooler sea surfaces, it'll begin to de-escalate because that source of energy, uh, warm humid air that's found over warm sea surfaces, uh, is no longer there. And so these, uh, in order for a tropical cyclone to develop, the sea surface temperature must exceed 26, point, uh, 26 degrees centigrade or 79 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is the region of the sea surface in red in which the sea, uh, this is an annual, annual average in which the sea surface is in fact above that temperature. So these are the regions in which tropical cyclones and hurricanes are born. So the ones that make landfall in North America, they form here and they take different trajectories from there. And there's ones that go across the Pacific this way and ones that go up that way too. And so you might have heard that with global warming and climate change that uh, extreme weather might be, uh, be intensified. Well, if tropical cyclones and hurricanes form over warm sea surface temperatures, as the climate warms, the sea surface temperature is going to increase too. And the area of the ocean that is warm enough for tropical cyclones and hurricanes to develop over, that area is going to expand, right? The ocean, this region is going to get larger in which the sea surface temperature is is warm enough. So you have a larger incubating area for these tropical cyclones and hurricanes to develop. And not only is the area in which these storms can um, develop increased, but they're going to be warmer for longer in the season. So you're going to have more time for these storms to develop. And then once they do develop, the sea surface temperature is going to be even warmer, so there's going to be more energy available to these storms. And so Whenever they say that extreme weather is going to intensify with, with global warming, that's especially true for tropical cyclones and, and hurricanes because the area of the sea surface that's warm enough for them to develop is going to increase in size. It's going to remain warm enough for a longer period in the year, so there's going to be more chances for storms to develop, and there's going to be more energy available to feed these storms so they can be, grow larger in intensity. So we can expect more and more hurricanes and stronger and stronger hurricanes as we move into the future as the sea surface temperatures continue to rise with climate change. So these are the paths of, of uh, typical paths of tropical cyclones or hurricanes in the, uh, on the, across the globe. You'll notice that, uh, that the hurricanes in the northern hemisphere, they curve to the right. And in the southern hemisphere, they curve to the left. You might guess that's due to the Coriolis effect. So the Coriolis effect is influencing them. Also, they're influenced by the winds. So here we have the trade winds, which are blowing the storm systems this way, this way, and this way. If they come high enough north, they enter the westerly winds, which then begin to blow them that way. Okay. So the hurricanes that hit the east coast of North America, they, they follow this trajectory here. The ones that enter the Gulf follow this trajectory here. So when is hurricane season in the northern hemisphere? When is it in the southern hemisphere? Well, basically, to answer that question, you know, 
when is the sea surface warm enough in the northern hemisphere? When is the sea surface warm enough in the southern hemisphere? Well, uh, more energy is being absorbed in the northern hemisphere during the summer. So by the end of the summer, early fall, the sea surface temperature in the say the this region in the northern equatorial Atlantic it's going to be at its warmest late summer early fall and so starting late August September October that's prime hurricane season in, the, in North America because that's whenever this sea surface is at its warmest okay. and over here that's going to be the same thing down here in the southern hemisphere this water is going to be at its warmest uh, at our late winter early spring because it's the opposite of the northern hemisphere. So that's once again due to the seasonality of the Earth that which results from the tilt of its rotational axis. Now storm surges are one of the most destructive aspects. They're not the most lethal. More people are killed by torrential down inland uh, precipitation and, and resulting flooding. But the storm surge is very destructive where the the low pressure of the storm system pulls water up like a vacuum, and so that creates a pressure-driven surge. But that's small compared to the wind-driven surge. So as the winds blow on one side of the cyclone, the winds are moving in the same direction the storm is, and as a result, water piles up in front of the storm. Whenever the storm makes landfall, it brings that large mound of water, called a storm surge, inland with it. Right here, if this is the normal high tide mark, that whenever that storm surge moves inland, this water is just pulled inland with it. And so we just have massive amounts of flooding through that storm surge, storm surge being brought in. Uh, this is the storm surge that was experienced uh, during Hurricane Sandy. Uh, and Hurricane Sandy made landfall right here. And in, in the northern hemisphere, this storm was rotating counterclockwise. So if the storm was moving this way, the winds on this side were moving in this direction, the winds on the other side were traveling in the other direction. And so to the right of the eye in the northern hemisphere, the winds travel in the same direction that the storm is traveling, and they pile up water in front of them. So you have the larger storm surge to the right of the eye of the storm in the northern hemisphere. So the color scale indicates the height of the storm surge um, uh, relative to mean sea level. Okay. And it's measured in feet. And so you can see the largest storm surge was experienced in, in New York Harbor and the Long Island Sound. And we had, we had some in, in Rhode Island, some destruction along the southern coast and Newport and Bay and Fundy. You see the storm surge was exacerbated in these narrow um, waterways like, like uh, sounds and bays where the storm surge gets washed into a confined basin where the water level increases rapidly. And so uh, storm surges are, 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 are very destructive uh, to property along the coast. Um, in the case of the storm surge of the Hurricane of 38, that made landfall over Long Island. Um, the storms, the resulting storm surge, caused so much flooding in Rhode Island that actually downtown Providence was flooded. And as a result of that hurricane, they built the Fox Point Hurricane Barrier uh, that you can still you can see in Providence, Rhode Island today. And if you go downtown in Providence, you can see plaques on some of the buildings that show uh, how high the water was during the uh, flooding that resulted from the storm surge of the hurricane at 38. And then once the hurricane makes landfall, the massive amounts of precipitation fall inland create um, large amounts of flooding. And that's that inland flooding that's responsible for the majority of hurricane-related deaths. But the storm surge is responsible for a large amount of the property damage. All right, thank you. That's our lecture in atmospheric circulation.